Hello and a very warm welcome to Talking Germany, the show where we do just that. And my guest today is one of the most high profile of Germany's up and coming generation of politicians. And here she is, Manuela Schwesig. Thank Hello. you very much for joining us today here on Talking Germany. How are you? Nice. Good. <laughs> That's a good start. Now, Man I'm in the pink. <laughs> <laughs> Super. Now, Manuela Schwesig is a social democrat, I should mention. She is the health and social affairs minister in the northeastern German state of Mecklenburg-Vorpommern. And she's made a name for herself by promoting, among other things, women's rights, children's interests and uh, family-friendly Germany. <laughs> Manuela Schwesig, I've been reading in the German press that you have said that your, your main goal in your political work is battling for social justice. What is, for you, social justice? For me, social justice means giving all the people in our country the opportunity to participate. A very tangible example, I think it's dreadful that there's child poverty in Germany. We're a rich country, but the truth is that many children now no longer have a warm lunch, they're not in sports clubs or music schools. No matter how their parents are doing, our children must have a chance to go to a good kindergarten, a good school, to do sports, play music, and above all, have a healthy, warm midday meal. I don't understand, and many of our viewers won't understand, why there is child poverty in Germany. Explain. Child poverty comes from the parents' problems. Either the parents have no work and live on welfare, or the parents do work and live on low wages. That's especially true in the catering industry, for example. It's one reason I'm fighting for a minimum wage. What does that mean? It means I'd like all people who go to work to earn at least eight euros fifty an hour. That would just about make ends meet. But it's important to me that the children go free of cost to a kindergarten, school and also a sports club, so that they have the opportunity to participate whether or not their parents are unemployed, civil servants or even politicians. I read somewhere that you are. I was, you were described as maybe a little bit idealistic. Is that a bad thing to be? No. No. For policies to be credible, it's extremely important to have ideals. If I don't have the ideal that all people should live together peacefully and in solidarity, I can't fight for it. That's why ideals are important. But you also have to be realistic enough and competent enough to convert those ideals into real policies. What we've learned from that report and from what you said earlier is that you're, you're full of enthusiasm for politics, you're an idealist in politics, but here in Germany, people, we're constantly told that people are disillusioned with politics, are disenchanted, are disgruntled. What do you feel when you hear that? I think it's a shame, of course. There are days when I work from morning to night and know that people are still somehow dissatisfied. But I also know that's the case, and it's clear to me why. The fact is, we politicians often no longer speak the language of the people at all. Politicians have so often promised something and later done something completely different. My party too, all parties. And people don't forget that, which is why they turn away and trust us very little. And that's also why we have to have ideals, to hope we can still continue to convince people that the way we're going is the right one. And when you talk about conviction there, are you convinced that you're different? I'm convinced that it's right to do something differently and I want to do it differently. Okay, okay, yeah. I read somewhere about you that you said of yourself, and here we go, I have a completely normal East German biography. What is a completely normal East German biography? <laughs> it's difficult. <laughs> um, been in the I grew up in the former East Germany without having experienced anything really bad, like friends of mine perhaps, such as being harassed by the Stasi. I went to a daycare center, kindergarten and school, and then I went through the process that this East German system dictated. 
But I also experienced the fact that people called very little of it into question. And after the collapse of communism, I was 15 at the time, I understood in retrospect how completely we were actually co-opted by the system. That turning point brought opportunities for me personally. I traveled, I could go my own way. But I've also seen that it had its dark side, like my father's being unemployed. There are no East German biographies where the fall of communism didn't change something or other, and that's why I have a normal, not so normal, East German biography. Mm. It's interesting that we, uh, you're talking about East German biographies, and of course the, the, the Chancellor here in Germany, Angela Merkel, she comes from the East as well, she's a woman like yourself, so there are, co there are common factors there, and I would just like to ask you just for a very quick answer, is the fact that you are a woman in politics, has that helped or hindered you in your political career? Quick answer. Before. Helped. Okay, okay, there we go. Straight off. Now, for some reason, and we will be talking about it very, very shortly, there is still, despite what we've just heard, a very thick glass ceiling here in Germany, preventing women from making it into top jobs in anything like significant numbers. Now, as a result, there are growing calls for a quota system that would ensure that there are more women in senior management. We have this report. This woman has the guys under control. Andrea Schauer has been the CEO of the toy company Playmobil for a decade. That makes her an exception in Germany. More than 50% of the people who get university degrees in Germany are women, but only 5% end up in top management at German firms. That's something that's entrenched in Germany, and it has to change. When quotas were first introduced for women in politics in the 1980s, it first caused a stir, then the policy prevailed. Now they're talking about the same for business. That's because women only account for 2.5% of the executive board members of Germany's 200 largest companies. Telecom became the first German company to introduce a quota. It committed itself to ensure that 30% of its leadership positions are occupied by women by 2015. With the current distribution at 10%, they have a way to go. Our aim is to get women, talented women, who are not copies of men or re-educated men. Part of the program includes allowing for part-time executive positions, because taking a break to have a baby and raise children often interrupts careers. Even long-time critics of the policy, such as the former Liberal Free Democrat politician Hildegard Hambrücher, are coming around to the idea. I expected men would be reasonable, understanding and collegial. I was wrong. That means I support the use of a quota, if the business economy won't do it voluntarily. But in the meantime, the question as to how to impose such a policy is still unanswered. Um, quota, yes or no? Yes. It's very important to have a quota in Germany. Nine years ago, the federal government under Gerhard Schröder came to a voluntary agreement that companies would make sure more women were given executive management positions. Nothing happened. One single DAX company did something, and I don't want to wait another nine years until a second company follows suit. Quotas have to come. You're a little bit angry there, I, I, I guess. I can, I can hear that you're a bit disappointed with German industry about their failure to sort of really budge on this issue. Uh, but I, I'd like to ask you the broader question, where the problem lies. Are the men the problem, or the men and the women? Or, you know? Men and women together are often a problem, and sometimes not. But joking aside, the problem is the structures. First, there are too few daycare facilities. If a woman decides to have children, it becomes very hard to combine a job with that. Why? 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 In Germany? Because there are scarcely any daycare facilities in Germany, especially in the West. Providing a place in daycare for any child who wants one is an East German tradition. And in Western Germany, they talk about unnatural mothers. The expectation in Germany is that if you decide 
decide to have children, you should stay at home and take care of the kids, even though women want something completely different. Women want both. They no longer want to have to choose. A second problem is the glass ceiling in business. Many men in management decide among themselves, and women barely have a chance to get through, and that really only works with a quota. For a long time I was against quotas, but now I've become convinced. And many women in executive management are convinced we need a quota to force companies and women to do what's good for them. Do you have role models in your political career? I'm not the sort of person who idolizes others, because I know we're all fallible, and these exaggerated expectations are often a problem. But of course there are people who inspire or have inspired me. One is Regina Hildebrandt, an Eastern German politician, unfortunately deceased, who was always incredibly authentic. She was a fighter, and before I was ever interested in politics, I used to turn the radio up when she spoke and turn it down when others spoke. Angela Merkel. Yeah, that's the reason why I asked the question about having a role model. She's made it all the way to the top, so she could be a model for you. No. No. Frau Merkel has betrayed women and Eastern Germany. I'm very angry with her. Betrayed. Verraten. Betrayed. Yes. It's a strong word. When she became chancellor, even though she didn't belong to my party, that wasn't important, I'd hoped she'd speak up for women and talk about how difficult it was for women in Germany. The same goes for Eastern Germany. I hoped she'd stand up for Eastern Germany and our interests and report on how difficult it was for many people. But she doesn't say a thing. That's why I'm disappointed. Interesting comments. Change of topic. There's been a real sea change on Germany's employment market in recent years. Now, the trend is away from full-time jobs with long-term contracts, often jobs for life, and towards what are often part-time jobs with short-term contracts. The problem is, how do you build a life when you're drifting from one job to another? Anna Lend works at the Georg Kolbe Museum in Berlin, where she gives tours and plans exhibitions. The 30-year-old says it's her dream job but she only has a two-year contract. Despite professional experience and an art history degree with top marks, she's had five different jobs in the last three years, and the opportunities for long-term employment are thin. Anna often asks herself how she's going to manage, to get married, have children, and maybe own a house someday on a limited contract and low salary. For her parents, both teachers, steady work and good pay were givens. When my father was a student teacher, it was clear that someday he would have tenure as a civil servant and could start a family. So he did. I can't do that yet. Statistics show that one in four people under 35 is on a limited contract in Germany. Their jobs are either part-time or temporary. And their numbers have risen by nearly 7% in just a decade. Sandra Rotemund works for a temping firm. It has assigned her to production work at the BMW plant in Leipzig. For the flexibility demanded by the modern labor market, she has had to leave her family and boyfriend in Saxony-Anhalt. I'm always hoping that, no matter which company I get sent to, that someday I'll end up getting a full-time job out of it. But that hasn't been the case. Back in Berlin, Anna's boyfriend, Boris, was luckier. He studied the right subject. As an industrial engineer, he got a contract for a full-time permanent job after a year and earns the lion's share of the couple's income. But they're still not planning for the future. Anna says she doesn't want to be dependent on him. And she says many employers lack, above all, respect for their employees. It's a matter of how they value me as a worker. If I'm really good, they should give me a proper contract to keep me around. Anna's contract at the museum expires in February of 2012. After that, she says her future is uncertain. What's the problem? Yeah? Limited contracts for employers? Great thing. 
Ja, für die Arbeitgeber sind sie ja, ideal. Ja, ideal für Employers, aber nicht für Employees. Especially when young people have a job, they want to know whether they'll have it for more than half a year. I want to identify with my company. So I also think companies would be well advised to keep people on for longer. But it's disastrous for starting a family. If I know I have just one job for the next six months and don't know what will come next, I'll often decide not to have children because I don't know if I'll be able to raise them. Mm. Uh, when you t we've talked about social justice and when, when we see that some people have long-term contracts, possibly even jobs for life and other people have very short-term contracts and all the uncertainty is that a class divide in germany is that how you see it it's a huge problem of fairness because we have many young people in germany who have top training they've lived abroad they offer everything an employer could want but they go from internship to internship half year's job year's job they just never get anywhere they never settle down that's why i insist that good working conditions are part of good family policies Only when work creates a family-friendly environment do I decide to start a family. Mm. There is, of course, the problem that if people have long-term contracts, possibly even a job for life, the young people don't get into the system because the jobs are taken. That's not quite the case. That's the problem when people leave the long-term normal jobs that existed in the past. When people leave their jobs because they retire, employers don't say, I'll find someone to fill that position. They try to do it more cheaply with temporary jobs and internships. And the federal government allows that. It even wants to expand the practice, so we have even more temporary employment. And we don't want that. We say that in order to start a family, people need good working conditions and they shouldn't be exploited. Okay, okay, point taken. Um, tell me this, um, an, another short answer. Yeah? How, how much do you work each week on average? Lots of hours. <laughs> 60 to 80. Yeah. Yeah. That's political living, you know? But the life of a politician, I was very interested there to see how many hours you work in a week. Um, you need a rest. You're going to be going off to Hiddensee for New Year, I hear. Sylvester of Hiddensee. Yeah. I love Hiddensee. Are you going to run the report now? Let's do it. <laughs> She's given us the start on this one. Hiddensee, you've heard us talking about it. It's one of the uh, most charming holiday destinations here in Germany. It's located on the Baltic Sea coast in Manuela Schwesig's home state of Mecklenburg-Vorpommern. Uh, it does, though, tend to be a pretty quiet place in the winter months, and the locals use the extra time they have to go, get this, amber hunting. The island of Hiddensee is dormant for winter, but it's the right season for what's known in German as amber fishing. No one knows where to find amber better than Ingo Engels. A local native, he's been on the lookout for what's known as the gold of the Baltic since he was a child. His wife, Elke Hochschild, shares his passion. Winter storms wash it up to the water's edge. Some bad storms here have washed the whole beach away. Then, when it calms down, you can find amber. Amber is fossilized conifer resin that's between 40 and 60 million years old. It can be white, yellow or red. The 19 square kilometer island has some 1,000 residents. Few tourists come in the winter. It was love that brought Eike Hochschild to Hiddensee just over two years ago. She says her husband is a typical northerner, hospitable but reserved, like many of the locals in fact. He explains. It's a culture of its own. Winter is solitary and summer is busy. In the end, you're happy when it quietens down again. The couple uses the winter season to turn the amber they gather into jewelry for tourists. Although statistics show Hiddensee has as many as 400,000 overnight stays each year, they've got plenty of time before the summer bustle begins. Now, I've, I've been to Hiddensee. I know what the charm of the place is, but there's going to be a lot of people out there in the world that possibly won't have heard of Hiddensee. So tell us what the special charm of this island is. It's a tiny little island on which there are only a few people, even when all the accommodations are booked out. 
and on which there are no cars. You use a coach and horses or go on foot. You've got endless beaches to stroll along. You see the sea and nothing else on the horizon. You can jog, go for walks, sleep, eat well, light a fire when it's cold, and after a week you've really recuperated. You told me something very interesting just before the programme got going, that when you actually go away on holiday, you don't take a mobile phone, no news sources whatsoever, no media, no newspapers. Is that true? You're a politician. Yes. <laughs> and you, can, you, you, you come back into politics then and the, you haven't missed anything? You're just straight back in there in the middle of it? Time and again, when I come back, I realise that not much has changed and the world's continued to turn without me. That's something politicians should take heed of. Uh, I read about you that you, uh, you've described yourself, Hiddensee, the island we've just been talking about, is way up north in Germany. And you've said of yourself that you've got a sort of a real northern German mentality, a northern Germany sort of uh, approach to life. Tell me a little bit more about that. What, what's that all about? The northern Germans are a bit more reserved. They bide their time. But once they've taken you to their hearts, you're really in there. I don't come from so far north originally, but my husband's a northerner, so I've seen plenty of that. Sometimes it makes sense to wait and see, but sometimes I don't have that northern German patience and I blow up, especially when things aren't happening fast enough. Uh, now, you, let's move from the north of Germany just the, to the east of Germany. You, you are in the parliament in an eastern German state, part of the former East Germany. And I know a lot of our viewers are very interested to know whether the problems that have been faced by that area of Germany are really now being solved. Are we on the right path now? What can you tell us? We're making progress. The towns have been redeveloped, the economy is growing slowly, but we have more jobs. We're managing to get young people who left because there were no jobs to return, and by now we're pioneers in a way. We're experiencing the fact that our population is shrinking and we're growing older. We face great challenges. We lack doctors, for instance. How can we ensure that there's medical care? And today we're already offering solutions that the West will need in the coming years. My generation in particular provides a role model for women, because we show in our lives how you can combine a family and career. We no longer let anyone impose a debate about being unnatural mothers on us. Some very good news there from, uh, from Eastern Germany, from Manuela Schwesig. I'm writing a blog about my encounter today with Manuela Schwesig. You'll find it on the Talking Germany website. Have a look. If you're into Talking Germany, you can find out more on the internet. Your host, Peter Craven, is keeping a blog on the many shows and guests in the series. Find out more about what happens behind the scenes, gossip, experiences, how the whole show is put together. Just visit blog.dw-world.de slash Talking Germany. And you can tell us what you think about the program there, too. And we're going to finish off the program with a quick whiz through our typical talking or our traditional talking Germany quiz. Here we go. First question. Idealism or realism? Idealism. Beaches or mountains? Beaches. <laughs> Running or dancing? Two of your hobbies. Running and dancing. Uh, career or family? Family. As a boss, would you rather have a man or a woman? Woman. <laughs> and what about your career? Are you going to be staying in Schwerin or are we going to see you coming here to Berlin and taking up higher office in federal politics? I stay in Schwerin. <laughs> we might believe her, we might not. That's it for Talking Germany this time round. Our guest is one of the people at the heart of German politics, or at least very close to the heart, one of the up-and-coming stars, if you like, of German politics. If you've enjoyed her company as much as I have, then do come back next week. Until then, bye-bye and tschüss.